Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this special virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're joined this afternoon by the Mayor of London, Ed Holt, the Warden of Middlesex County, Kathy Burkhart-Jessen, and the Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey. A welcome this afternoon also to the media in attendance. We appreciate you joining us as well on short notice today. Uh, we'd also would like to welcome listeners and viewers who are tuning in on Rogers Television as well as the Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel. Listeners on Global News Radio AM 980 CFPL. Listeners on News Talk 1290 CJBK and also those tuning in this afternoon on the ctvnewslondon.ca website. All right, let's get to the opening remarks. We'll start this afternoon with Mayor Ed Holder. Well, thank you, Dan. Look, this isn't a decision uh, we make lightly, but let me tell you, it's one made with absolute certainty when we look at what's been happening in our community over the last week. We said from the start of the pandemic uh, that the health and safety of Londoners and those of Middlesex County was our greatest concern and number one priority. Those words are being reinforced today with this action. With full support from the City of London and the County of Middlesex, the Medical Officer of Health has requested the province reduce the size of private gatherings in London Middlesex to a maximum of 10 people indoors and 25 people outdoors. This applies to private residences only and not businesses. This is also in line with what was announced yesterday for Toronto, Peel and Ottawa regions. Now those who organize or host illegal social gatherings can be fined a minimum of $10,000 and those who simply attend such party, parties and gatherings can be fined $750. And look, the reality of where we find ourselves right now is undeniable and unnerving. It's also unacceptable. We haven't seen a two day case count such as we've experienced over the last 48 hours since mid April. And depending on how we fare over the weekend, this could become the worst stretch of cases in London Middlesex since the pandemic's onset. Now, there are those who may say this is unnecessary and there may well be others who say it doesn't go far enough. But it's my firm opinion that the actions being announced today are rapid, reasonable and responsible. It also does not preclude us from taking additional measures in the near future if this recent surge is not reversed. Ultimately, however, while various restrictions and public health orders may lessen the risk, it can only be fully contained by the actions we commit to ourselves and each other as part of a caring and compassionate community. Please wear a mask, physically distance, avoid large crowds, wash your hands. We can do this. We just need more of us to do a little better. Let's get back to what we've been doing so well over the last several months. Stay safe, stay healthy and be considerate. So before I turn it over to uh, Warden Burkhardt Jessen, I'd like to close on a lighter note by wishing uh, friends in London and across the region who are celebrating Rosh, uh, Rosh Hashanah at sundown tonight. A happy, prosperous and sweet new year. Shana Tova. Warden, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Ed. Um, I have watched with growing concern, as many of you have, the numbers both across the province and locally as they have risen in the last few days. And this rise only highlights the need for continuing vigilance when it comes to following COVID protocols. To the residents in Middlesex, while the recent outbreaks that we are learning about and that we've learned about in the past few days are in London, the information that has been shared recently by the health unit shows how quickly and in some cases how silently COVID-19 spreads. It will not take much to see increases in cases in Middlesex should we let our guard down. We only need to look to the, our neighbours in the United States to see how as cases began to increase again this summer, rural areas were hit. So as the mayor has just said, um, with the health and safety uh, uppermost uh, in our mind with concerns for our residents uh, in the county and the city, uh, I fully support uh, the uh, actions that Dr. Mackey is requesting. It is important that we all act responsibly 
so that, that we all remain safe. We must be mindful of adhering to physical distancing requirements. Wash your hands. Stay home when you feel ill. Mask up. And remember, your social bubble should only remain at 10. Consider how you are gathering and be respectful of others. Together, we will all get through this. We've done so well up until now. Now is not the time to let our guard down. And um, we will uh, get through this as long as we look out for each other and look out for ourselves. Dr. Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Warden Burkhardt Jessen. We, uh, we find ourselves in a very unfortunate situation. Uh, the number is provincially 415 new cases today. That's a high since early June. And locally, 13 cases today. Again, a high since early June. And that puts us right back in pandemic levels. This is the second wave, and uh, we are seeing substantial disease spread in the community. Uh, fortunately, the disease spread continues to be focused at Western. Of the 13 new cases today, 11 are students at Western. Um, this is why uh, we have asked for uh, provincial support, reducing the gathering limits uh, to 10 people indoors and 25 outdoors. The, uh, the spread of the illness in the Western students is virtually all linked to uh, partying in bars and restaurants or in private homes. Of the 11 Western cases today, nine are associated with a house party, that second cluster we mentioned earlier this week. Uh, so we know that reducing gathering limits will make a difference. And we're very grateful that the province has offered to extend the uh, gathering limit reductions to other jurisdictions. Uh, from my understanding, that may happen as early as um, an announcement today and possibly implementing over the weekend. Um, and in any case, we're uh, grateful for that. If uh, for some reason that doesn't come about, we're prepared to issue a class section 22 order uh, to limit gatherings sizes in this community. But uh, of course, much better to be participating in and aligned with the, uh, the provincial regulations. Uh, so there are a couple of other issues that bear mentioning today. Uh, the most important being that we have had a small outbreak declared in a Walmart. Uh, you saw the news release from Walmart this morning, and we followed up with some additional details from the health unit perspective. Fortunately, this uh, outbreak in Walmart is small. At this point, we only have uh, three cases associated with the, the outbreak, and uh, because the employees worked in a low-risk setting, there's very little uh, direct face-to-face -face exposure with clients uh, at that Walmart, so the risk to the general public is uh, very low. However, uh, we continue to encourage people who have symptoms that, are, that could be associated with COVID-19 to attend an assessment center and get tested. This is not the recommendation for people who don't have symptoms. If you simply went to Walmart and do not have symptoms, we do not recommend that you seek testing. Uh, please monitor yourself carefully and seek testing at the first sign of symptoms. Uh, the risk for those who do not have the symptoms of carrying COVID-19 is extremely low. Uh, we know it, it's in the range of one person in a thousand who doesn't have symptoms that will test positive. Um, uh, and there is not a good reason uh, unless you've had direct contact with one of the individuals. We've worked with those individuals at Walmart. We're confident that we know who they've had direct face-to-face -face contact with, and we have been in touch with those individuals. Uh, so again, with the Walmart outbreak, risk to the general public is very, very low. Uh, that said, you know, the continuing spread among post-secondary students is a concern, and uh, very hopeful that uh, the two-pronged attack we have on that outbreak will be successful. That first prong in terms of uh, more proactive inspections in uh, restaurants and bars that we know in the past have been quite crowded, uh, has been very successful. We've seen the uh, high risk behavior drop off substantially in those settings uh, based on inspections last night. Uh, we know Thursday night is a usual, usually a party night for Western students. So very happy to see uh, that they refrained from gathering in large numbers on uh, Richard Monroe and elsewhere. 
uh, last night. I'll pause there, Dan, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Madam Warden, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do have some questions. They're starting to roll in. And again, a reminder to the media in attendance, if you could please indicate your name, your media outlet, and who your question is for when you submit your questions here on Microsoft Teams. Uh, Dr. Mackey, let's get to the questions. The first one is for you. It comes from Steve Young at CTV London and News Talk 1290 CJBK. Dr. Mackey, are any of the cases being reported today related to the cluster highlighted yesterday? Is this a new cluster? Dr. Mackey, I believe you're on mute. Thanks for the question, Steve. We've had uh, three clusters represented in the case today. Uh, nine of the 13 cases are Western students associated with this, the uh, second cluster that we did mention yesterday associated with that house party. Uh, one of the cases at Western is associated with the L Furniture Warehouse. You'll recall uh, last Wednesday, a little over a week ago, uh, before we declared the community-wide outbreak, there was a small outbreak associated with L Furniture Warehouse. Uh, so one of the cases today is a Western student associated with that uh, cluster. And then uh, we did have one case that was associated with the larger original uh, cluster from this past weekend that uh, generated the declaration of outbreak at Western. So, uh, and then of course, uh, so there was also one Western student with no link to any cases uh, and one individual with a link to um, the um, outbreak at Walmart. Uh, there was one individual where uh, the, that was uh, part of the cases being announced today uh, who we are unable at this point to contact. We'll be doing a home visit at some point today uh, it's unusual that we can't reach the person within 24 hours, uh, but unfortunately in this case we haven't been able to, at least uh, as of our briefing, internal briefing this morning. Uh, so we're continuing to work on contacting that person to identify any potential links. All right, thank you, Dr. Mackey. So that uh, is for the 13 cases reported today on the Middlesex London Health Unit dashboard, which is on our website at healthunit.com. A follow-up question, Dr. Mackey from Steve Young once again. With Fanshawe starting up next week, do you have any thoughts of a COVID-19 testing center being set up on campus uh, at Fanshawe College? Yeah, so uh, I know this is something that Fanshawe is considering. Uh, they do have primary care resources at Fanshawe for student health. Uh, so our hope is that Fanshawe would be able to uh, make testing available and we're certainly uh, support them in terms of obtaining obtaining swabs and making sure the samples get processed. All right, uh, the next question. Uh, this Dr. Mackey, I believe, is also for you. It comes from Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press. How many Western students have tested positive? What are their conditions? Uh, so the Western students that have tested positive was 28 by the end of yesterday. We've added 11 today, so we're now at 39 uh, Western students that have tested positive since uh, this past weekend. So uh, that's not uh, from the whole outbreak, uh, sorry, for the whole pandemic, but for the outbreak period that we're talking about the past week or so, uh, we're at 39. Uh, their conditions, as far as I know, are, are good. Uh, I'm not aware of any of those students requiring hospitalization at this point. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question comes to us from Grant Demi at MyFM Radio in Strathroy. Uh, Dr. Mackey, I'm thinking this one is for you as well. Would schools and more specifically class sizes be in, impacted by this section order or would classes still consist of more than 10 students? So the gap that we're trying to fill here is really about private gatherings, particularly those in people's homes uh, or other um, outside of a facility. Uh, businesses are already under significant restrictions and regulations. And from what we've observed, there's a lot of compliance. We also have people reporting any businesses that may be deviating from regulations. And we're able to handle that in terms of uh, the coordinated actions between city bylaw, uh, the public health inspectors and the police. Uh, so the city or county bylaw. Uh, the the um, uh, so, so the restrictions in gathering sizes uh, that will come either through provincial regulation or through a class order, uh, whichever will be 
uh, more expeditious. Uh, those will be for private gatherings, either in a residence or you know, something else that somebody has organized uh, outdoors. For businesses, uh, this won't change uh, the restrictions or regulations uh, under stage three for which businesses, under which businesses are currently operating. All right, thank you, Dr. Mackey. Let's go to our next question. Uh, this one comes from Elon Peterson from the Western Gazette. Uh, Dr. Mackey, will the MLHU be making any recommendations to Western about any changes on campus in light of the potential new gathering limits? Yes, uh, we've had substantial discussions with Western at this point in terms of uh, the, the uh, activities on campus, as well as messaging to students and use of the code of conduct uh, at Western to ensure that students are behaving uh, safely. And that Western is taking all of those steps. In addition, Western has voluntarily uh, closed all activities that are not academic in nature, all clubs, extracurriculars, et cetera, that are done in person. Uh, have been uh, suspended for this academic year at Western. All right, let's move on to our next question. Um, all right, another question from Jennifer Beeman. Uh, Dr. Mackey, if the province doesn't come through today to extend the gathering size restrictions, when will you issue the Section 22 order? Uh, so we will be looking to issue that as soon as possible, either uh, Monday or Tuesday next week. Uh, but at this point, we do anticipate that the province will be able to uh, add us to the provincial regulation. The advantage there is aligning and also timing. The Section 22 class order takes a week to come into effect, uh, and we believe the province is willing to move more quickly than that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, okay, we are going to... Um, <laughs> Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press. Yes, she just asked that question. Uh, Kate Dubinsky at CBC News in London. This one is for Dr. Mackey. Uh, Dr. Mackey, when did the house party associated with the nine students at Western happen? Do you know how many people were in attendance and do you recommend that in-class classes be canceled? Yeah, so the, uh, the house party it, uh, occurred last weekend uh, so uh, we're, this is why we're still seeing some cases appearing now related to that one party. Uh, do we know how many people were in attendance? Uh, we don't have an exact figure. We've had different estimates uh, from different uh, individuals, but certainly it's in the dozens given how many cases we've already seen come out of that house party. Uh, do we recommend in classes, in classes, in class classes be canceled? Uh, we're not recommending closing uh, in-person classroom activities. Uh, academic activity obviously has huge uh, benefits for the students and for community and for society. So uh, we would we would do that if necessary. But we're also not seeing any spread that is linked to classrooms or academic activities. This is really about you know close close contact in extracurricular activities at this point. All right, let's go on to the next question. And this next question is from Jane Sims at the London Free Press. And I'm thinking this is for uh, Mayor Holder. Uh, would the city be willing to take an extra step and close down bars and restaurants for a couple of weeks if the caseload keeps rising? Actually, Mayor Holder, if you'd like to start and Dr. Mackey, if you'd like to comment afterwards. Sure. Well, let, let's be clear. I'm not uh, telling uh, Londoners to avoid bars and restaurants. What I'm asking people to do, though, is to act responsibly and follow the public health uh, guidelines. Look, fact is that bars and restaurants have been open for months now. And if the owners and operators weren't behaving responsibly or if these venues were inherently unsafe, we wouldn't have the extremely low case counts we've seen up to this week. But if the choice is an unregulated and irresponsible house party with no, over, no oversight, no health and safety protocols being followed, or a local restaurant where names and phone numbers of patrons are taken, masks are enforced, proper space in between tables is in place, plexiglass, and hand, sanitiz hand sanitization, excuse me, and more, the restaurant and the bar is a far better option. 
And if we close those, reduce their hours, people who might otherwise have gathered in that environment would likely wind up crowding, crowding into those private residences, which is truly the challenge and the intention towards this, uh, the provincial regulation. And those are harder to track, harder to locate, and often more difficult to monitor. So I hope that uh, that clarifies uh, where we are with this. Uh, Dr. Mackey, your thoughts? Uh, certainly, and uh, happy to have the warden's thoughts if she's interested as well. Uh, so the question around closure of businesses, I mean, this is really what we're all trying to uh, work to avoid. You know, as we've discussed before, there are three goals in a pandemic. First of all, is to protect uh, protect, uh, prevent deaths, second of all, to prevent illness, and third, to prevent disruption to society. Uh, the What we've seen is that, you know, we had a conversation with the bar operators on Wednesday, made it very clear what the expectations would be, um, and they've really stepped up in terms of honoring those. Uh, and we've really seen safety improve in, in those settings where it was problematic. And again, vast majority of restaurant and uh, bar operators have been operating safely all along. So, uh, you know, if we and if there are closures, I mean, you probably know Love Lost has announced on their Facebook page that they voluntarily closed for two weeks in order to quarantine staff. Um, that's a, a welcome decision on their part. And um, if if there are closures at this stage, it would be most likely that it would be to uh, individual businesses that are not operating safely rather than to an entire industry where literally 99% of the operators are operating quite safely. Um, thanks for that, um, Dan. You know, I'm just going to echo uh, what the mayor has said and what Dr. Mackey has said. Um, we don't want to get into position again where we're closing businesses. Nobody wants that um, to happen. And as the mayor said, um, if there had been concern um, with the way our restaurants and patios and bars have been um, operating over the last few months, uh, both in the city and the county, we would have seen spikes uh, to uh, the case counts, and we haven't seen that in the summer. So for the most part, I do believe that our bars and restaurant owners are acting responsibly. They're working with the health unit. I was on that briefing uh, with uh, Dr. Mackey and the mayor earlier this week, and certainly uh, in no uncertain terms, the restaurants know what they need to do, uh, and I believe that they're doing that. So um, as long as they're doing what they're doing and we adhere to what we're supposed to be doing, then I think uh, we should be able to move forward. Uh, just fine. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mackey, and thank you, Mayor Holder. Let's go to the next question. This one comes to us from Brian Wood at News Talk 1290 CJBK. Uh, a follow up for the amount of students uh, that Dr. Mackey mentioned. And Dr. Mackey, in reading the question, I think this is more about how we report the numbers. So, Dr. Mackey, you just said 39 total Western students in the last week. Would it not be 49 because of the 28 Western yesterday? plus 10 of the 11 yesterday being Western and another 11 Western students today. Yeah, so um, we've we've only had 47 total cases over the past week, so um, I'm pretty sure that the 39 from Western, the Western outbreak is the right number. Uh, we'll double, yeah, it's 39. Uh, we've just double checked that. So uh, it may be that, uh, that the, the number 28 and the number 10 came out uh, in relation to the same uh, number of cases. Um, that's that's likely what you're seeing there. I appreciate the follow up, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mackey. And uh, I do know that between the cases that are reported on the dashboard, which are the total cases from the previous full day, uh, with the last couple of days with things moving as quickly as they have, some of the current case numbers during the day get included. But as Dr. Mackey, we can assure you that uh, 39 is the correct number. A follow-up question from earlier, uh, Dr. Mackey, from Steve Young at News Talk 1290 CJBK and CTV. Will either the provincial order or the class order from the health unit be in place for this weekend? Uh, we don't know for sure. Hopeful that uh, we will have uh, the provincial order in place as soon as possible. Class order, uh, the, the legislation actually 
uh, prescribes a minimum one week delay. When you're ordering an individual or a business, uh, you can make an order that is immediate uh, with the situation that you're seeing in front of you. Uh, but when you're ordering a class of individuals, um, naturally it takes time for those individuals to learn about the class order uh, and to you know reorganize their lives. So the, the class order process has a minimum one week delay. That's why we're hoping for uh, the prov province's support to use their regulation and uh, crossing our fingers that that is in place at least at some point over this weekend. Thanks, Dr. Mackey. And uh, a follow up question. Actually, it's not a follow up. It's actually seeking some clarification uh, on the class 22 order. And it's from Jen Beeman at the London Free Press. If it doesn't affect businesses, but would it doesn't affect businesses, but would the Section 22 order or provincial gathering size restriction affect weddings, funerals or church services? So the new restrictions that we're looking at are really in uncontrolled environments where you have an operator who's responsible for a facility. Uh, there is uh, a lot of incentive for the operator to operate safely in order to protect their their business or their service uh, from being closed or from uh, being fined. It's it's where people are uh, gathering in private environments that there currently isn't um, a lot of uh, regulation or oversight and you know again very reluctant to take this sort of step we know that the vast majority of our community is uh, acting quite safely uh, we know that there have been large gatherings that have been done very safely uh, whether it's an outdoor wedding or an indoor event where uh, there is adequate space for physical distancing uh, restaurants are a great example where operators have gone above and beyond to try and create safe environments in all sorts of innovative ways uh, but we don't have much that uh, limits that activity in private environments and so that's what we're looking at here all right uh, let's go to the next question this one is from kate dubinsky at cbc london uh, dr mackey when did the house party associated with the nine students at western happen do you know how many people were in attendance and do you recommend that western or Fanshawe in oh we actually we already answered this one I apologize all right let's uh, let's move on so much happening on the question forum this afternoon uh, another question from Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press Dr Mackey evidence of community spread in London was low through the summer we knew the infection origin for most cases how did the initial cases that fueled these Western student outbreaks arise is there evidence to suggest someone unwittingly brought the infection to London when moving from a harder hit region of the province as for instance the GTA? I think that would be a reasonable speculation uh, Jennifer but we don't have evidence around that at this point. Uh, we do know that when Western students you know returned and started partying that's when we saw cases uh, but we don't know uh, where those first cases acquired their infection. Uh, that's definitely something we're still investigating. Uh, but at this point, uh, we're, we're far enough out that um, people aren't necessarily able to remember what they did, you know, a week or two ago. Uh, and so it's it's unlikely we'll actually be able to identify the first case that brought, uh, that kind of reintroduced uh, COVID-19 into this community. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, we've got a couple of more questions, so let's get to those. Kate Dubinsky again at the Free Press. At the Free Press. My goodness, Kate, my apologies. Going back in the time machine there for a little bit. Kate Dubinsky is, of course, with CBC London. Uh, Dr. Mackey, what recommendations are you giving to students who have tested positive and need to quarantine, given that they often live in houses with multiple roommates? What about students who are living in residence? What has been put in place to allow those students to quarantine? Yeah, so we've certainly uh, made the recommendation for uh, Western that anyone who is living in a dorm environment and tests positive uh, be removed to a, uh, a, a living quarter that is uh, more facilitative of them uh, self isolating. We know that has happened um, in the one case that uh, um, that lived in that circumstance for each case where an individual is being directed to self isolate at home uh, because they've tested positive. We do an assessment with that person looking at, you know, shared washrooms, shared uh, food preparation facilities, 
and, and uh, ability to keep distance in their home. And we, we certainly have, uh, in some cases, um, had to move people to different accommodation in order to facilitate safer uh, self-isolation. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. We're down to our last question and right on time as we approach 2.30. Uh, this one is from Steve Young at CTV London and News Talk 1290 CJBK. Dr. Mackey, is this the start of a second wave or do you think it's a continuation of the first wave? Yeah, I, th I think, great question. I think from our community's perspective, this is a second wave. It's in a new population at a new time where, you know, even looking across the general community, there isn't a lot of activity. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's very unfortunate that this has happened. Uh, we're very hopeful that it can be contained to the Western, you know, and it's really undergraduate and really, you know, a lot of first year students uh, who in general are younger and at much lower risk of a severe outcome. i uh, very much hoping it doesn't, this wave doesn't spread into the high risk community like long-term care, for example, uh, that we've seen in the past. But th this is distinct enough uh, that I would I would definitely call it a second wave. Thanks, Dr. Mackey. And just under the wire, Kate Dubinsky has sent in a quick follow up. And seeing as I identified her media outlet a moment ago, I'm going to let her have this one. Uh, from Kate, Dr. Mackey, quick follow up. You've got students to be moved if they can't self isolate. Where do they go to hotels provided by the health unit? Yeah, that really depends on the circumstance. The health unit wouldn't provide the hotel, but we would. Uh, uh, support that person to get appropriate housing. Uh, you know, our very first case at Western back in February, I remember uh, she essentially negotiated with her roommate who decided to uh, vacate the apartment and gave her the space to herself. Uh, we've had others that have been moved and not just students, but others from uh, the community that didn't have adequate housing. Uh, a good example is the, temp the, the small number of temporary foreign workers we had. Uh, that tested positive related to a farm in uh, Elgin County. You know, now that we're on the topic, um, I do want to mention that uh, we have concluded our work testing temporary foreign workers uh, in farms across London and Middlesex. We we're able to test about two thirds of those temporary foreign workers uh, in the range of about 87 workers were tested. Uh, we were on every farm where there is a temporary foreign worker and we had a total of zero cases that were positive in London or Middlesex. They were temporary foreign workers after testing 87 people. So very happy with that. Uh, we haven't had the same sort of issues that others have had in those. Uh, but when we did have that outbreak in Elgin County, uh, certainly some of the temporary foreign workers that have been housed in London, even though they're working in Elgin, uh, were moved to a hotel motel sort of situation where it was much easier for them to self-isolate. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Madam Warden Burkhardt Jessen and Mayor Holder. That uh, that brings us to the end of our questions today, and I appreciate you all staying on the line a little longer than our allocated time. And I'd like to thank the media for tuning in as well today. Uh, and again, thank you for making the time uh, this afternoon on such short notice. We will be back next week uh, with our next virtual media briefing on Monday. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you next week.